Uh, welcome everyone for coming. Uh, before I welcome our guests, I'd like to invite those not who've not already done so to please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Magnumind Academy. We upload recorded sessions of these talks, so you can watch them later, and you can also comment any questions or thoughts you have on the talk today in the comment section. I'd like to now welcome Sarah Hooker and her talk, uh, How Do Models Learn? We at Magnumind try to find speakers who can give workshops with a different perspective or different information to go along with our data science education programs. So these kinds of talks would be would count under that. These programs range from focusing on the fundamental skills of data science, all the way to helping a career change into the industry. Our goal at Magnamind is impacting as many careers as we can, and this is just one way that we do so. Sarah joins us from Google, where she works as a full-time research scholar and has also done work on, on their brain team, focusing on algorithm interpretability and deep neural network compression. She is also a founder and director of educational outreach for a nonprofit organization called Delta Analytics, which provides pro bono data science and analytics consulting for nonprofits around the Bay Area. We're very excited to have her. And now please give your full attention to Sarah Hooker. Hey, thanks, Thomas. Um, OK, excellent. So uh, let me just drag my slides out. So I, I, I think the, the goal of today is perhaps to give you a feel of some of the research that I do um, at Brain. And also, uh, feel free to ask questions. I'm not sure if we have Q&A during the chat, but I'm happy um, if uh, if someone can be the collector of questions, maybe Thomas, we can stop and pause at certain times. So please feel free to drop questions in, and then we can see how we go. Um, but let me just, so, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is this really interesting question, which is the focus of my research, which is how do we tra train models that fulfill multiple criteria? So, in fact, a lot of uh, early computer science history is focused on simply achieving models that uh, achieve reasonable performance on tasks, so high tested accuracy. But because of recent breakthroughs, we've now realized that high tested accuracy is not everything. And a lot of what I'll be talking about today is my work on ensuring that model functions that we train are not just high performance in terms of tested accuracy, but also interpretable. Other work that I'm interested in doing is model compression, fairness, and security. And these properties are all additional desirable criteria which may not be fulfilled when we only uh, optimize with respect to uh, something like cross entropy. Um, and today we'll be covering a few different things. Um, it will, uh, I, I may go over certain things fairly quickly, but I'm hoping to convey the following. So one is why we care about this. Why do we need to go beyond tested accuracy? And what does interpretability look like in deep neural networks? Um, the second is some misconceptions about interpretability of deep neural networks. And in particular, uh, when do we need interpretability and when do we place less emphasis on it? Um, and then the, the final is to give you a flavor of some of the questions that I'm interested in. And I'm going to be sharing some of my recent work with collaborators. Um, so I think that will be fun as well because you'll get a flavor of what I'm thinking about and what might be what is kind of at the forefront of interpretability research. Um, so let's kick it off, so to speak. Um, but uh, to start with, I want to really think about this concept of accuracy without true learning. And to, to, to think about that, um, I want to introduce you to a very famous horse called Clever Hands. And Hans the horse was in Berlin, I believe around the 1870s through the 1890s. If you, I guess everyone's got that computer open so someone can uh, find the correct timeline um, and add it to the, the chat. But um, the fascinating thing about Hans the Horse and why he was so famous in Berlin was that he showed a remarkable propensity to be able to emulate what we call intelligent behavior. So for example, um, he was able to count and estimate the amount of uh, people in a crowd by stomping his hoof to indicate the estimate. And of course, this was remarkable and spurred a lot of interest. How can this horse evidence this type of intelligence? Um, and it turned out that uh, Hans the horse could not. <laughs> uh, in fact, there was a very clever experimental design where um, if a human did not actually know the answer to the question that was posed to Clever Hans, 
clever hens could not respond with the correct answer. Um, and this was used to demonstrate that what clever hens was actually doing was uh, picking up on microscopial facial expressions of the owner or people who asked the questions to try and arrive at the correct answer. Um, and this is a great example of what I mean by high accuracy without true learning. And uh, the reason why this is important is that uh, it, in many ways, what has happened over the last decade since 2012 is that we have delegated learning to the function of the model because in many fields, state of art models now are things like deep neural networks. And there, we no longer explicitly map what features are extracted. In fact, a big reason why deep neural networks are so powerful is that we delegate, delegate the feature representation to the model itself. The model learns to extract what features are important based on a cost function, but it makes it harder to interpret. Um, and this has and can lead to clever hands moments. So this is a picture, these, these two, two images here um, are pictures of, um, <laughs> apologies for the, the slightly annoying thing at the bottom. Let's say if it disappears. Oh, lovely, it disappeared. <laughs> um, but these two pictures with the true label of cow are interesting because one a model predicts correctly and the other model doesn't. Which one do you think it predicts correctly? The one of the cow in the pastures and the, the one that of the cow on the beach, it predicts incorrectly. Um, and perhaps if you got this right, your intuition was the following, which is that the cow that is on the pasture is, uh, is a much more prototypical image of a cow. So in a training set, there are many, maybe many such images of cows uh, in green landscapes of different assortment. Uh, and the cow on the beach is in fact far less typical. So uh, these parametric models uh, tend to do, uh, tend to perform less well on underrepresented slices of the distribution. Um, and for a limousine on, on uh, these two images, again, we have the same problem. A model predicts one correctly and one incorrectly. Which one do you think it predicts incorrectly? Oh, I have a comment from Raj. Write one on snow. Yes, yes, excellent. Everyone's, oh, someone said not on snow. Um, so I like the diversity of, of responses. Um, so Alice says on the right, so it's the, we seem to have an ensemble consensus that it's the image on the right, which is the one on snow. And that is correct. That is the one that predicts incorrectly. Uh, and the, you, I, I'm sensing that what people speculated when they wrote that is that the reason it predicts that incorrectly is that we rarely see limos on snow. Most of the time we see it uh, in these type of urban environments. And so again, we have this understanding problem where the model has actually learned to pick up on the background of the image rather than the image itself. Because if a human were presented with these images, we would be able to be versatile enough to be able to still recognize that this was a limo in these two images. But the model, because it's learned to correlate the limo with the presence of concrete or an urban landscape, in fact, uh, has learned to have high accuracy without true generalizable learning. And uh, this is another two fun examples. So the one of the pastures is actually, this is a captioning model by Microsoft. And uh, the one of the pastures is tag sheep, presumably because uh, there's, a, there's many images like this that often have sheep. And the one of uh, the two children holding a sheep is tag dog, because <laughs> presumably there's a lot of images with children holding a dog in this criteria. Now these are kind of fun, interesting examples. Um, but when clever hands moments happen in a sensitive domain, there can be huge cost to human welfare. So these are two studies in the healthcare domain, and in both there's been spurious correlations. So the spurious correlation is when a model leverages information that's not related to the true relationship you want to capture. Um, and so the example of skin lesions is what, what um, the authors realized was that the model was leveraging for a certain subset of images of malignant tuners, uh, the model was leveraging the presence of a ruler. And the presence of the ruler in these images meant that whenever the model saw a ruler beside a tumor, it projected malignant. Of course, not all um, photos that the model would be used at test time would have a presence of a ruler. So this is a great example of kind of these sharp clips and finger points that can happen when we, um, when we set up 
models in ways that are not expected to generalize. Um, the one in pneumonia was a metal tag. So the hospital images had a metal tag that was associated with a certain hospital. So the model just like to associate the presence of that metal tag uh, with a certain condition. Um, and uh, parametric models, kind of going back to those early examples of the underrepresented vantage points, if your underrepresented vantage points are protected attributes, this can have a disparate performance on your protected attributes. So there's a lot of fantastic work in this area, but really this has implications for notions of fairness. So the work um, on the right, which is Genesheds, shows that uh, commercial APIs don't perform uniformly on people of different race and genders. Um, and the work uh, on the, I guess my right, which is uh, this map, um, is really interesting because it also shows in our typical open source data sets, certain vantage points or certain images uh, are very underrepresented. So for example, if you have an image of a groom, most of them tend to be Western grooms. So typical suit and in a Western setting and much less represented are other types of wedding ceremonies. Um, so it's really interesting from that perspective. Um, and really the goal of interpretability is to try and understand when these issues occur. So it's to provide intuition to aid auditing or model behavior. Um, and this is meant to empower humans to gain an understanding of the decision boundary. Um, and top line metrics, so I do see a stream of questions. So I will pause in a little bit. So please keep the questions coming because this is quite fun. <laughs> so if you, if you uh, accumulate questions, I'm gonna stop after the next section and we can, we can try and take a look and see, see which ones are fun to answer. Um, so uh, this idea that top line metrics often hide critical behavior. And so we need interpretability tools to order and understand. So what does that look like? What do interpretability tools with deep neural networks look like? Um, there's a few key directions of research. So one is model distillation, where you have a much larger model and you try and distill the performance power into a much smaller model that's considered more interpretable. So for example, there's been work on distilling uh, deep neural networks into decision trees. Uh, the tricky thing is it's actually very hard to preserve a comparable level of performance. So this is kind of a nascent research direction um, because you do give up. Um, it's, it's very hard to, uh, really this gets to the core trade off of, of when people want a more, what is considered interpretable form is you end up sacrificing some amount of representational power. Um, there's also visualization tools that reduce dimensionality of deep neural networks. So humans are terrible beyond two dimensions, three at a stretch, but for high dimensional spaces where you are looking at these very complex landscapes um, it's very hard for us to navigate and understand distance. Um, and in fact, many of these visualization tools are powerful because they're allowing you to understand notions of distance and relationships in these high dimensional spaces. In particular, TSNI, um, many of you may be familiar with because it's used heavily to visualize embeddings, um, but also there's increasing work on how do we visualize the lost landscape. And the key question here is always, well, how do you actually measure distance and what is a good notion of distance here? Um, and that itself is an open area of debate. Um, this is fun because I think people don't typically think of this as interpretability, but I do. I think it's a really fascinating way to understand how a model learns. Um, agent-based exploration, particularly when an agent is learning a new problem, really gives you an interesting insight into the decision boundary because you're able to see real time how the, mod how the model interacts with the environment. And so things like this, which is from OpenAI, actually provide a huge degree of intuition uh, to a human viewer because you see essentially as training occurs, unlike a uh, convolutional neural network where you kind of deploy it and look at test and accuracy at the end, you see how it's evolving in its environment. Um, and then this is estimates of future importance, which we'll talk a lot, a lot more about today. Um, and there's a few different types. So there's local feature importance, global feature importance, weights and activations. Um, and so local feature importance is really focused on how do we, and I might have an example, oh, excellent idea. Um, so local feature importance is really this idea of how can we explain a single explanation? So this is um, heavily used. You may have even come across it as a saliency map. Um, and it's, you have a single image and then you're trying to predict for that image, what are the pixels that contribute most to a prediction? Um, and there's many different types. <laughs> um, and then global feature importance 
uh, are really uh, these estimates of future importance and the contribution to the overall decision boundary. So what examples does the model find challenging or easier to learn? This has been a topic of research I've been involved in a lot, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But I think this is a very interesting future direction of research, and there's very interesting current results. Um, and then ways and activations are really, we move from the input space, which is the data space, and now we're trying to understand what is the role of individual neurons and weights, the so-called kitty neuron. So what, what features are extracted by different neurons? Here, again, open research question because it's papers with contradictory results. There's some results that show that you can only extract this type of feature importance um, when uh, you don't have batch norm, for example, uh, whereas a, paper by Marcos, who's at Facebook, showed that when you have regularization, which is typical of deep neural networks, it becomes much less, uh, you're less, much less able to, to say that a neuron is specialized. There tends to be more diffuse specialization of neurons. So um, I'm going to stop here. Let's see what questions we have. So is there general assumptions about how things are associated, but how does the capture model capture associations that are specific? Ooh from wheel and power. I actually do not quite know what this question is saying. So it's a general assumption about how things are associated. So I guess I, I'm trying to decouple what I think you're saying. I think what you're saying is, um, do we have an understanding of how things should be associated? Um, and that would inform how we believe a model should associate features. So um, I this may be that I don't understand the question, but I'm actually going to interpret it as quite a profound question. <laughs> and uh, the question is the following, which is that um, in many ways, going back to that example of spurious correlation. So I did read the question. I think it was just a little bit poorly formed. Um, so so Jess is saying, can you please read the question and answer it? So I actually did read the question, but if if you didn't understand it, that's probably why I didn't understand it. <laughs> um, but let me give it a go, because we should move on. But here's a here's an attempt to answer the question, which I believe was saying, well, how do we know that it's unfair to leverage these background features? How do we know the right things that the model is supposed to leverage versus not? Uh, and that's actually a valid question, because um, in, in many ways, the way that we extract features, we may leverage background information. So really, the test of what is fair to leverage and what is unfair to leverage uh, depends upon what generalizes. So it's OK to associate limos more with urban environments, as long as you're still able to uh, recognize a limo when when you presented one in a rainforest. If, if your performance falls off a cliff when you're presented with something in just a slightly different environment, that's the type of data leakage that we don't want. We don't want a model to overly rely on background features. OK, I'm going to move on, but please keep the questions coming. Um, so what are some misconceptions in interpretability? So misconception one is that a model is either interpretable or not. And this is a fairly common misconception. It's the idea that, in fact, we have um, either something that is interpretable or not, and, and thus things are either bad, uninterpretable, or good. And the truth is interpretability is a much more nuanced concept. Uh, the reason being that there's never going to be a finish line with interpretability, <laughs> in part because it's a very subjective notion. So what is interpretable to me may not be interpretable to you. Um, or what is interpretable to someone who knows how to code may not be interpretable to someone who doesn't know how to code. A good example is I frequently get messages asking, uh, would, should we just release models, uh, model weights to the public? Um, would that improve interpretability? And the truth is, it's not clear that it would, because uh, for many downstream tasks, a consumer wants an explanation for their prediction. They don't want to go inspect model weights. And so the notion of interpretability is intrinsically grounded than subjective. And that is what makes it incredibly hard to measure progress on. Um, and it's unlikely that you will ever sign off on a model as done. This is interpretable, ship it, um, in the same way that we often talk about performance. 
Um, misconception too is that we need all models to be interpretable. In fact, interpretability is a uh, it's a desirable property property just like any other, and uh, it may be influenced the way that we place on it may be influenced by multiple factors. Um, is this a sensitive domain? So uh, is this a domain in which an incorrect prediction will inadvertently affect? human welfare, um, that would be an example of a healthcare domain um, or uh, um, self-driving cars, credit scoring. Um, the second is the trade-off with other desiderata. So going back to the example of releasing model weights, the other implication of releasing model weights is that it can compromise privacy because all of a sudden you have all these model weights that are publicly available, uh, you can incur adversarial situations where those can then be leveraged to compromise the data privacy that was used to train it. Um, so when that occurs, when there's that type of trade-off that's present, uh, in fact, you may place less weight on interpretability because you want to also fulfill other criteria. Um, and then the third is historical performance. So if you have a lot of data about the performance of a model in different settings over a longitudinal period of time, uh, you may have enough combinations of input-output scenarios where you have trust in the model, even though you don't understand the underlying function. Um, and this is important because uh, often when we need interpretability the most is when we're deploying for the first time. We don't have a good sense of how the model is going to behave. We don't have much historical data. And when that's coupled with a sensitive environment where welfare can be impacted, that's where we get a lot of discussion around interpretability is really important to audit what we think the potential impact of the model can be and to try and uh, proactively uh, anticipate and prevent harm. Um, misconception three is that interpretability methods shouldn't lie with human judgment. So in fact, diverging from human judgment does not mean that the model behavior is incorrect. Uh, so I'll give you an example. So there's a retinopathy paper, which uh, is fantastic about how uh, computer vision models, CNNs in particular, were able to extract new features um, from these images of retinas that humans cannot. Um, and for example, they're able to extract features like whether the person is a smoker, the gender, that doctors were surprised by because they could not identify that based on the images. Um, and the reason why is that often, particularly for medical images, human vision is log scale, which means that we tend not to register small changes. It takes a noticeable change for us to register. Um, and that's mainly to protect us because we don't want to be registering every single change that happens in the world. Uh, we want to only notice the big changes. There's no such constraint on deep neural networks. In fact, you can have small pixel-wise differences that impact a uh, deep neural network and a deep neural network extract that as usable features. Um, that also means that for tasks like this, where the difference in features may be so subtle, what what did what which leads to classifying someone as a, a, a retina for a woman versus a man, um, deep neural networks might perform better. And so different is often not bad. It often gives us new insight into a problem. Another example is really alpha, uh, a really nice example that I like is AlphaGo. Um, and this is essentially um, a really interesting problem because uh, many AlphaGo players in real life enjoy playing AlphaGo to understand more about their own craft and to understand uh, more about the game itself and to try new moves. So uh, this section is uh, really interesting and it's about the merits of global feature importance estimates. Um, and this is getting into a, a little bit of discussion of my work, which you may find interesting. Um, and to start with, I, I kind of want to talk about why local feature importance estimates are often not enough. So as I mentioned, there's been a large amount of interoperability research that's focused on local feature importance. Um, I uh, showed you the many different methods that you can choose from. And uh, I will, to, to give you a sense of why so much focus has centered on this, um, it's for, in fact, multiple reasons. So one, re so one reason that so many um, research papers are focused on local feature importance is because the feature scale for deep neural networks for computer vision problems is very high dimensional. So if you have an image, you often have a quarter of a million features and to try and estimate and rank feature importance across not just that image, but entire data set is very expensive. And so there's been a question of how do you do this type of ranking and estimation cheaply? Um, the, the second uh, aspect of this is that uh, 
for many use cases, we may in fact want a local feature importance estimate. For example, for a certain end users, if I go to a doctor and I'm trying to uh, see an explanation of model behavior for a scan, I'm gonna always wanna see the model prediction from my particular scan. Um, however, there are other use cases um, and uh, there's many different methods to choose from. Um, however, there are other use cases, and this is what I'll be talking about shortly, where um, these are not sufficient. And in fact, a lot of my research has centered on this. Um, so there are key limitations to this approach. One is that uh, what is meaningful in these explanations is does not equate with reliable. Uh, so earlier work that I've done with my colleagues uh, has shown that in fact, many of these saliency map methods can be manipulated. Um, so you can have a constant vector transformation in fruit space. Uh, and many of these attribution methods, even though it doesn't affect the model itself, it only affects the data space, uh, are sensitive to it and change the explanation. Uh, and in fact, we find that once you detect this vulnerability, you can actually manipulate it explicitly. Uh, so you can even force an explanation to showcase a little kitty cat, <laughs> um, which is fun. Um, this, and I built on this work actually in another paper, which was showing uh, the premise of how do we measure whether the estimates are better than a random guess. Um, for example, what we did was we looked at uh, if you extract the features that the model believes is most, that the attribution method believes is most important to the model prediction, if you were to remove that and then retrain the model without that, what uh, attribution methods degrade performance the most? Because in some ways you're kind of asking, for example, a mechanic to remove parts of the car that he thinks or she thinks is most important. And then you'll see if the car still runs. And so if the estimate was good, you would expect the degradation to be much higher. But we find that many of these methods are no better than a random guess. Um, and this is important because for any method that we choose, we want both meaningful and reliability. Uh, and that's because these estimates often use to audit model behavior in very sensitive environments. So an incorrect explanation can often be more damaging than no explanation at all. Um, but the, the main limitation of these methods and what I'll posit today is, so let's say we've done this. And so we have a statistic map and we presented it to the person. What happens next? For example, this is a saliency map of a sandwich and it's uh, detected as most important uh, as part of the sandwich. So is this a good saliency map? Is it a bad saliency map? Does this mean that you should have caution with your model? How do you make a decision next about what to do with this particular model? Um, and uh, in fact, that's uh, the tricky part is that often human understanding is relative. And so uh, often when posed with this, uh, the challenge is people need a relative understanding of what's a good and a bad sciency map. But that's very difficult when you have the scale of data sets that we have in the present day. Um, and we have such enormous training data sets that it's infeasible for a human to spend the time looking at each and every sciency map to gain an understanding of a decision boundary. In fact, um, I think that one, one part of this is understanding what can, how can we surface automatically examples which um, are, are much more worthy of human auditing time. Uh, and so we want to understand relative importance. And what we want to do is surface examples that are most useful for a human to spend time looking at. Um, because uh, in particular, we want to understand what does the model find challenging to learn? Because if you can surface that of what is the most challenging and least challenging to learn, uh, you can have important impact on downstream tasks. So this could impact uh, what you choose to data clean or spend time for further annotation. And you can also identify issues with fairness. So I'm gonna talk about two different papers which have actually looked at this and um, done some work on thinking about how do we cheaply rank? Because remember the big issue, why I talked about the reliance on local feature importance was this perceived inability to efficiently and cheaply rank. Um, so I'll talk about that. Let me see if there are any more questions and then we can go from there. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, so, is a prediction of a model the same as a philosopher gaining truth where truth is hard to gain? Okay, this is quite a long question. Um, 
What is the difference between interpretability and explainability? Okay, so I'll take that one because some of these are a lot more general and I'll come to them at the very end. So uh, the difference between interpretability and explainability of a model um, is that, uh, so explainability is often thought of as, as a subset of interpretability where you're providing an explanation for a single prediction. So explainability is often thought of as what I described as these local feature importance estimates where essentially uh, you have a single input and you're trying to explain importance relative to that. Interpretability is this broader series of directions that I described where you, you may have model distillation, you may have various different tools you're using to gain intuition into the decision boundary. Um, so uh, the first paper I'm gonna talk about is estimating example difficulty using variance of gradients. Uh, and uh, the first, Part of that is uh, we start with hypothesis, uh, and the hypothesis was that maybe what we could do to arrive at a cheaper ranking of feature importance is to look at how it differs over the course of training. Now, there's some interesting work that already exists in this dimension, which is uh, showing that there are distinct stages of training. Uh, for example, there's work by my colleagues at Brain, which show that early training tends to be associated with learning easier examples, late training tends to be associated with memorizing the harder examples. And there's also interesting work which suggests this critical learning periods where if, for example, you corrupt the inputs early in training, the model is, is not able to recover later in training. Uh, and so we leverage that insight here and our hypothesis was the following. Uh, we believe that we could surface more difficult examples uh, if we looked at the variance of gradients of examples over the course of training. The reason being the following, uh, we, the, the model as it updates its gradients, uh, for easy examples, our assumption was that the gradients converge quickly because the model quickly places that example in the decision boundary and the gradients converge to a narrow range. Uh, for harder examples, in fact, the gradients may oscillate uh, a lot over the course of training because the model is having difficulty learning where to place on the decision boundary and may end up in fact making multiple different predictions. Uh, and so what we do is over the course of training, you typically save your checkpoints. And so what we do is uh, we leverage these checkpoints to then estimate the variance. Um, and we call this the variance of gradients or VOG. And uh, what's interesting is that this gives us a relative ranking of each class. What is the examples as a model find challenging or easy to learn? Uh, what's great about this is that uh, it actually proves to be very effective at surfacing what a, mo what a model finds very difficult um, and very easy to learn the prototypical, which is the easy and the critical examples. Um, so for example, here you can kind of see that what it surfaces are these distinct semantic clusterings. Um, and so we have here a horse um, and uh, a lawnmower, and you can see that for the horse and lawnmower classes, the lowest VOG tend to be uh, not very cluttered. They tend to feature kind of distinct poses of the object, and the highest VOG tend to be far more cluttered. Um, you can kind of see uh, not only are they cluttered, but they tend to feature more unusual uh, vantage points. Uh, and what's even more interesting is that if you look at VOG ranking early and late in training, you see that there are distinct differences. So late in training, you arrive at these crisp clusterings. Early in training, as the model is still gaining an understanding of what training um, uh, is, it, you see far less distinct clusterings. Uh, and you can gain insights from this, such as there appears to be a color bias. Uh, in some networks. Uh, so for example, uh, it appears that for the lowest VOG tends to favor uh, the, the color red. This is, the class here is boy. This is CIFAR 100, which is an open source data set. But it also allows you to gain an understanding of the overall ranking, which is important. Uh, quantitatively, uh, we show that VOG effectively discriminates between easy and challenging examples. So this is really important for anything that you use to rank because you want to show that when you choose high VOG, you're actually choosing the ones that you want to surface as difficult. And what we show here is we show this bar chart of bottom 10, all tests, and top 10. And what we show is that the bottom 10 have a far lower top one test and error, um, which means they're far easier to classify. And then the top 10 is a far higher top 10, top one test and error. 
Um, and the benefits of this is that it fits into your practitioner's current workflow. So you can leverage a checkpoint stored across training. Um, and then the other papers, which I'm going to talk about briefly, because I'll open up for questions uh, for the rest of the time, is uh, really, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm interested in training models, not just they're interpretable, but compressed. Um, and this work is fascinating because what we do is we leverage compression to gain interpretability. Uh, and what we start is with this remarkable observation that deep neural networks demonstrate this puzzling ability to remove the majority of weights with minimal loss of tested accuracy. So you can take a model which has 0% pruning, and then you can prune 50% of the weights, and you see <laughs> barely any difference in the overall, overall top one performance. Um, and even if you pr perform 90% of the weights, so you only have 10% of the original weights remaining, all you lose is 3%. And so these uh, metrics are for ImageNet uh, uh, trained with a ResNet 50. Um, uh, but what it really shows is that oh, we have this kind of puzzling question. Why is a model with a radically different structure number of parameters, how can it end up with comparable performance? Um, and this has a real world motivation because in fact, compression techniques are widely used in the real world, uh, mainly because they show certain benefits. So with compressed models, you have lower latency, lower power usage and portability. Um, and this means that they are deployed uh, in many of the resource constrained environments uh, where we are attempting to use and democratize AI and technology. And so a large part of why this question is interesting in understanding what why they're able to retain this ability um, and what what is lost in the process is because it has implications for AI safety and how we use it in compressed models. So what we do here is we ask two questions. We say, are these compressed models more sensitive to certain types of distribution shifts? So for example, adversarial examples uh, or corruptions. But also we say, let's go beyond test and accuracy and let's ask how these models perform on a disaggregated basis. So not just top one, but look at class level performance and look at individual examples. Um, and to do this, we train models at different levels of sparsity um, and we compare for each level of sparsity uh, the performance with the baseline model. And uh, sparsity of 90, as I mentioned, means that by the end of training, the model only has 10% of weights remaining. Um, some nice properties of this empirical setup is that the models all achieve similar regime of top line performance. And we can precisely vary how radically the weight representation differs by controlling the end sparsity. Uh, and we find that certain classes are disproportionately impacted by pruning. Uh, so in fact, pruning is not uniform. So while overall accuracy is pre preserved, uh, the subset of classes are disproportionately impacted. So performance on a subset is cannibalized to preserve this overall top line metric. Compressed models are also more sensitive to adversarial attacks. Um, so what we show is that if you look at ImageNet C and ImageNet A, which are data sets used to measure sensitivity to this distribution shift, uh, this is uh, essentially, you're looking at your x-axis, 0 to 90%. Um, you can see that as you increase the sparsity in the model, uh, the sensitivity to ImageNet C corruptions also increases. Um, and uh, ImageNet A is a, a collection of natural adversarial examples. And again, we see that as we increase the level of sparsity, it's more sensitive to those adversarial examples. Uh, and while this is, suggests, uh, in fact, that a lot of caution should be used when using compressed models in the wild, it also provides an exciting opportunity to leverage compression for human and elite auditing. And what I mean by that is that by understanding where the performance diverges between the compressed and non-compressed, we can automatically surface the detection of problematic examples uh, to surface to a domain expert. Uh, so these we call pruning identified exemplars. Uh, and this is an example of a non-pi and pi, but I'm about to ask you. So this is an ImageNet test set. What is the true label? Courage, you can do it. So Ho says lens. Okay, good guess. Excellent, good guess. Not quite. This is in fact labeled toilet seat. Uh, oh, G says drum. That's I would say also better, but uh, in fact, this is an example of a pi image um, and uh, a non-pi image, which is the pi is the toilet scene. Uh, so ImageNet test set, true label, what is this one? 
Wine glass, says Natish. Okay, a stout. Intriguing. Beer. Okay, cool. Wine. Everyone's, everyone's, uh, okay. Excellent guesses. All seems like everyone's ready for a drink. In fact, this is espresso. <laughs> um, what is this one? Matrix. Oh, I like that guess. Okay, good guess. A maze. Oh, Nicholas. You got it correct. That's excellent. That is actually the first time I've given this talk and someone has gotten it. So bravo to you, virtual claps. <laughs> uh, what is this one? <laughs> Carpet, okay. Sky, okay. Cloud, cloud. A lot of people saying clouds. So in fact, the true uh, label of this one is wool. Um, and what about this one? Matches, again from Nicholas, matchstick, bamboo, bamboo, walking stick. So it is, in fact, matchstick. Um, and the commonality, as you may have guessed, in all these examples is they're very difficult. So these were all pie examples that were automatically surfaced. And it shows that Pi is able to give you these very atypical uh, examples that the model finds challenging to learn um, and that are forgotten when you compress so that you can surface and understand the dynamics better at training. Um, and what is interesting is that these difficult examples cluster around two groups. So one is noisy data points. These tend to be improperly structured. So for example, they may feature both a tennis racket and a tennis ball, uh, and the model is predicting tennis racket, but the true label is tennis ball. So the model is not wrong, but it's just improperly structured for a single image classification. Or they might be severely, uh, severely corrupted. So an example of corruption would be like you have high contrast, or it's a very difficult for a human to figure out where in the object, the uh, where in the image the object is, or it's mislabeled. Um, the second grouping is a little bit different, and in fact, it's atypical, so it's challenging examples. And this tends to be underrepresented vantage points. In fact, many of the examples I just showed you, like <laughs> the wine glass that was actually an espresso, that's an underrepresented vantage point. That's very long tail, um, because it's rare that you see an espresso in a wine glass. Um, and uh, often this also includes more challenging tasks, such as fine grain distinction. So a good example of that is that in ImageNet, uh, there are classes that are very similar, such as Milo, which is a type of swimsuit and swimsuit. Uh, there's also Swiss Alps and then uh, mountains. There's very, very similar classes. So these are examples which would be hard for a human to distinguish between. And in fact, like we may see it as the same. Um, so this is more challenging. Um, oh, actually, I did include some examples. That's great. So in fact, uh, these are incorrectly structured examples. So uh, here, the true label is parallel bars, and the model predicts uh, horizontal bars, the prune model. But in fact, you could also argue there's a horizontal bar in this image. Um, and uh, here, the second image, the true label is corn, but um, the prune model predicts ear of corn, which is actually a part of the corn. Um, and so it's also correct. Um, so that was really a qualitative study <laughs> with you as the participants, but we also did do an extensive human study, which showed that uh, pi is more challenging, but we also quantified it. So we looked at the test set accuracy uh, on these pi examples. And what we showed was kind of remarkable. We showed that performance on Pi alone is far worse than performance on the overall set, test set. So in fact, Pi is doing a really good job surfacing the most challenging examples. Um, and that if you remove Pi, um, you in fact uh, improve performance beyond baseline. So it aids in generalization. So I've given you a lot today and I'm gonna pause because I wanna open up for broader questions. I'm also happy to answer questions about doing research and machine learning about my own career. Uh, so I'm gonna leave time for that. Um, but some final thoughts are there's plenty of interesting open questions in interpretability. So one is how do future choices uh, emerge over the course of training. The work that I showed you with my lovely colleague Shirak uh, is actually looking at precisely that. Variance of gradients is looking, how, do, how does the model learn over the course of training? And can we identify earlier on what the model finds as, a, as difficult? Because then maybe we can intervene early on in training to correct for that and prevent things like bias. 
Um, the second is, can we optimize explicitly for interpretable models? So a lot of what I presented to you, particularly in the directions of interpretability, was treating interpretability as a post-training problem. You train a model, you optimize it with cross-entropy, and then afterwards you do acrobatics to make it interpretable. But uh, there's almost, uh, you have fewer degrees of freedom by the time you train a model. Instead, can we just optimize explicitly for what we think is interpretable? And then the third is uh, really let, moving away from just looking at local feature importance, because there are all these failure points, and having auditing tools that surface examples that are relatively more challenging and automatically surface them, um, which is important when you're dealing with data sets which have millions of instances. So I'm going to pause. So I've given you quite a few things to think about, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so maybe I'll pop up the question. OK, we have 25 questions. Excellent. <laughs> Keep them coming. Um, so let me find some good ones. How does quantization affect the model accuracy? Is it the same as pruning? This is from Kajal. That's a great question. So quantization, um, for those who are not familiar with it, so pruning is removing weights, and quantization is changing the bit representation. So uh, a common form of quantization is that you may change your bit representation uh, from float 32 to float uh, 16, and then you might go to B float. So there's different levels of quantization. And in fact, now it's possible to train, uh, to train binary models. <laughs> so you don't even retain the flow. Um, but uh, do you lose more um, model accuracy? No. In fact, quantization is also shown to be remarkably effective. Uh, in fact, uh, we did extend the work that we did on subcategory impact for quantization. We found that even there, quantization actually outperforms pruning because quantization is able to preserve better performance on these underrepresented groups. Uh, so even from an AI safety standpoint, uh, as of now, I would suggest to practitioners to use quantization rather than pruning uh, in order to prevent this disparate harm. So that was a great question from Kajal. Um, and then we have a lot of guesses. So what is PI again, please? I'm happy to answer that. So PI is pruning identified exemplars. So PI is essentially the examples that are surfaced when we compare the compressed model to the non-compressed model. We ask, where does predictive performance differ? Um, and that's what surfaces these examples. Uh, Wayland says, what are the weaknesses of pruning? Well, I hope I've convinced you all that one weakness of pruning is that you have disparate harm, so it impacts some examples more than others. Um, another weakness of pruning, and this is more an open research question, is how we currently do it. So currently with pruning, we start a model over parameterized at the beginning, and we gradually introduce pruning to end up with a much more compact model. But there's a question in the research community of why do we need to do this? Why can't we just start sparse? Um, and uh, in fact, what, what's really interesting is that a lot of work in the research community has been focused on, is it certain things about our optimization process, which means that we can't just start sparse? Why do we have to do train a large model first before we can prune, if we can end up with a small model? So that is one weakness, and it's something people are working on. Um, so Nicholas says, when you say that removing pies increases performance, do you mean removed increased performance with low VOG images? Oh, OK, so this is a good question, because in fact, VOG and PI are two separate entities, ways of ranking. So in many ways, you end up with a similar angle. You're trying to surface the most challenging. But VOG uh, is using a completely different method. VOG is looking at the variance of cross-training and selecting as most challenging the gradients that have most variance. PI is looking at the difference in performance between compressed and non-compressed and surfacing as PI, uh, the examples which uh, differ. So in some ways, a fun exercise, which we're planning to do, so this work, both these works came out this year, is we're planning to compare the two and see if we look at the test set performance on those, which is doing a better job at surfacing the most problematic examples. Um, so it's a really interesting open question. But they're both trying to do, in a way, outlier detection. We're trying to surface challenging examples and the most easy examples for a human in the loop. Um, so anonymous attendee. Excellent. So the anonymous attendee asked, what will be your advice in terms of learning ML modeling and understanding feature points and feature selection? It's from someone getting into this area from a different tech area. So I can talk a little bit about that. I think it's an excellent question. Um, 
So uh, a lot of my own journey has been self-taught. So I started my background, my original background was in economics. And then I worked uh, doing economic antitrust modeling uh, for the Department of Justice um, and uh, the FTC. And then after that, I decided uh, that I... I, I guess two things happen at once. I started nonprofits. So I was working a lot with other nonprofits, helping them with uh, data. And then uh, I, through that, I realized that a lot of the economic tools that I was using don't scale to these rural data sets. So I became really fascinated by machine learning. And I threw myself in head first. Uh, I went through kind of brute force period of uh, four plus years <laughs> where I joined a startup called Udemy and then I was first as a data analyst, I transferred to engineering, I worked as a machine learning engineer and then I taught machine learning and then I joined Brain and I did research for um, the last three plus years. So um, I guess the first thing to know is that uh, your career is long and I think the most important thing is just to get started. Um, I, I think that a few things are useful, just speaking from my own journey, which has been what I would describe perhaps like an atypical journey, because a lot of it's been self-driven and self-guided, um, <laughs> um, is that it helps to choose something concrete to start with. So particularly studying um, something brand new can feel overwhelming if you go too wide. So I would always recommend choosing a project and something that you're passionate about. Um, and uh, the very practical nature of delivering on that project will help you learn a lot of the tools. The second thing is always work with people who are better than you. It's a rule of thumb uh, that I think is very, very important early in your career. So, and even later in your career. Um, uh, and the reason why is that it really accelerates your learning rate. Um, and then I think the third thing is, um, there is a brute force nature to the first part of learning. So at the beginning, uh, dedicating just sheer hours <laughs> uh, is really important. And I think that uh, if you don't feel like you're getting it, often it's because to become an expert in your field and build your craft typically takes about four years. Um, so I would say keep going. <laughs> uh, it won't come at the very beginning, uh, but I think that uh, because building a craft is very challenging, uh, the people who have the perseverance to do it and the passion to do it, you will make it. Um, I believe that because uh, I, I, a lot, having joined Brain and now doing research, I know there's no secret. <laughs> I, I feel like before I imagined all my colleagues as these brilliant geniuses and they're very smart, but they're humans. And so I now deeply believe anyone can do it. You just have to, um, you, you have to put in the time and I think you have to truly care. So if you're not sure if you like it, give it a year. If you're not sure you like it after a year, it may not be for you. And that's okay too. Um, that's excellent. So I think uh, I've run out of questions. Is that possible? Should I go to the Q&A or do people, we only have four minutes. So I'm also happy to turn it over to Thomas. Uh, if you want, there's a, it looks like there's a few more questions in the chat if you want to read those over. And see oh, those, I uh, see. Okay, to... excellent. Yeah. Oh, I, okay, perfect. Um, I see. Um, so this is an interesting one. Wouldn't a high epoch and very low variance cause overfitting? Um, actually, I'm not sure what's meant by really low variance. Uh, so course overfitting. So overfitting occurs when essentially um, uh, you achieve very, very low error on your training set. But in the process of achieving that low error in your training set, you compromise ability to generalize. Um, so typically what happens with overfitting, it's either determined uh, by using too much capacity for a problem. So if you have a huge network, it's more prone to overfitting. Um, or if you train for a really long time. So maybe that's what Atish is getting at by saying, wouldn't a high epoch, well, it's not high epoch. So epoch, by the way, is very, it's determined by your batch size and your total data set. So your epoch um, and the number of epochs in training uh, is determined by um, really what's your batch size and how many steps are you training for. Um, so Perhaps if what Atisha means is the number of epochs, yes. The number of epochs, if you train for too long 
um, and you're, you, you have too many epochs, then you will be more prone to overfitting. Um, uh, so how does interpretability play a role in medical imaging data? Uh, so this is where interpretability is really, really important because uh, medical images is a great example of where an incorrect prediction can have a uh, can have a, um, a impact on human welfare, and that's where we get really concerned. Is that particularly for tasks where uh, we see humans being impacted in a in a way that is profound. So not just a recommendation going wrong, but if your credit score is, is manipulated in a wrong way, or if you have a self-driving car and there could be actual human harm, uh, we care a lot more about interpretability. So long story short, yes, that's a perfect use case for interpretability. And it's very, very important. There's a lot of people working on it. So um, let's see. Can you mention... Can you mention a few use cases where the model's explainability can be leveraged to improve the model? I actually like this question a lot because um, I think it's a great question because explainability in AI really started because people didn't know how to train their models. So the saliency maps that I showed you earlier uh, were because there was a big issue early on with deep neural networks, which was poor gradient flow. So uh, gradients were either saturating or uh, they were they were flatlining, and for both cases, it meant that the model wasn't able to converge. So a lot of the heat map analysis started by researchers trying to figure out why that was happening. Uh, so it's a great example of that, how that aided some of the improvements to architecture choices that improved our overall ar uh, network architecture. But there's plenty of examples. Uh, that's why interpretability is a great research field, because the goal is really to uh, provide insights that are meaningful for humans so they can interact with their models. So, um, let's see, can the model self-optimize? Is the pairing down always manual? I don't understand that question, but maybe Christopher will, will reframe. Do we need to pay attention to local and relative features when we deal with controlled data sets like x-rays? Um, absolutely. So anything that uh, is sensitive, so x-rays I would definitely put in that category, uh, we should look at what the model is leveraging. Um, I don't know what controlled data sets mean, but presumably it means it's sensitive, so it's in the healthcare domain. Uh, yes, this is a perfect example of where we should care and we should look at what the model is extracting is important. Um, so on that note, uh, it has been lovely. I think we're out of time. I'm gonna turn it back to Thomas. Um, but it was uh, really lovely doing this panel with all of you. And thank you for the participation. I have been very impressed. Excellent guesses. Uh, actually, I would even say, uh, I think this, this particular panel is the first time someone has gotten a guess right. So, <laughs> so bravo, well done. <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you everyone else for coming. Uh, we try to hold these talks to keep people to further their learning and obviously to keep responding to your questions. So. Everyone has done that tonight, so thank you. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and please comment what you thought about today's meetup or what you think about our online Zoom format. Also, please join us for our next scheduled meetup on October 7th for our talk on meta skills for data scientists. Thank you everyone and have a good night.